Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network's Heritage Talks Online. My name is Heather Darch, and I'm here with Glenn Patterson, and we are project directors for the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network, also known as Quan. We are pleased to have you join our series this evening with its theme called Dreaming Big, inspiring stories from across Quebec. We have invited organizations from Quebec's heritage and cultural communities to tell us their inspiring stories. And it's really wonderful to hear from the historical societies, the museums, the community organizations, and the cultural groups whose vision has had a lasting impact on the history and heritage of Quebec. Quan itself is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to preserve and protect and promote the history and culture of Quebec, and in particular of Quebec's English speaking communities spread right across the province. You're welcome to become a member of Quan, and membership is open to everyone, including community groups and institutions. Uh, so please check out our website for more information at qahn.org. Membership gives you access to workshops and programs projects, publications going on in the small communities across the province, the work and the research that's happening as well by our member organizations. And it also means receiving in the mail our quarterly publication called Quebec Heritage News. And this is a really great magazine, a great publication from Quan. It's filled with articles and images all about history, history that you perhaps haven't read in history textbooks. So if you're interested in becoming a member, you'll receive this as well as being connected to a really great and dynamic network of people. Tonight, we have a special offer for first time new members. We have a 30% discount. That's $20 for a one year membership. And if you are interested, you can send us a message on Facebook Live, or if you're on Zoom tonight, you can put a message in the chat box that you'd like to become a member and we'll send you the information on how you can do that. The discount is only good for the length of time of the broadcast, so you can't wait. You have to let us know during this hour that's to come. I would like to thank the funders who helped make our series possible, including Canadian Heritage, the Zeller Family Foundation, the Chalkers Foundation, and the Townshippers Foundation. All of our presentations are recorded. So if you've missed any of our talks, or if you'd like to see this talk later on, you can go to our web, uh, to our Facebook page, Heritage Talks Facebook page, and there you can see all the recordings. You can also see the, uh, uh, the programs that are still to come in the series that goes on into the spring. And you can even check out the series from last year as well. And you don't need your own Facebook page because this is a public site. So I'm going to turn it over to Glenn just for a few minutes so he can tell you some of the uh, technical requirements for tonight's proceedings if you'd like to speak to Janice, our guest speaker, uh, after her presentation. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Heather. Good to see everyone here on Zoom. Um, so if you're having any trouble with Zoom, um, use the chat box. It's at the bottom if you're on a laptop or a PC. Uh, you can write a message to me directly or you can just send it to everyone. I'll do my best to help you out there. If you're on a mobile device uh, using Zoom, you may need to tap on the screen and then you'll see the chat box there. Um, as Heather mentioned, we are recording and we're also broadcasting live to Facebook and our YouTube channel. Um, so if for whatever reason, if you're not comfortable with that, um, you can always leave the Zoom call and hop on over to Facebook or YouTube and watch there. Otherwise, you're more than welcome to stay. Um, so that's all I have for now. I think when we get to the q and I'll, uh, I'll instruct you with the special uh, Q&A instructions there. So back to you, Heather. Okay, thanks very much. Well, our guest speaker tonight is Janice Rosen from the Alex Dworkin Canadian Jewish Archives. Janice has been the archives director of the Alex Dworkin Canadian Jewish Archives, formerly known as the Canadian Jewish Congress National Archives since 1989. She is also co-creator of the Canadian Jewish Heritage Network, 
a database-driven website showcasing the holdings of several partner archives and museums. Her talk this evening is called From Ship to Shoebox, Exploring Canadian Jewish History Through the Canadian Jewish Archives. Hello, Janice, and welcome to Heritage Talks Online. Hello, and thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm not actually where you see uh, behind me. Um, pretending I'm at the archives, but it's seven o'clock at night, as you know, so um, that is just an illusion. Um, I am going to share my screen right away, so you no longer have to look at me. There we go. Does everyone see that? We sure do, Janice. All of you, it's good to go. Okay, off we go. So, from ship to shoebox. And hang on a second. Um, sorry, I am just moving to my next screen. There we go. <laughs> okay, I think I have to press a little harder. Um, almost all of the visuals and vignettes that I'm going to share with you tonight have their origins in someone or their ancestor arriving by ship to this traditional and unceded Aboriginal land, which is now called Quebec. And so I start with a picture of a steamship ad, because that's how a lot of people made their arrangements to immigrate to Canada. As you um, as is symbolized by this beautiful picture of a couple uh, on a ship circa 1900, although I must admit they're not immigrating at the time this picture was taken. They married and came to Canada 30 years later. However, it's such a lovely picture that I wanted to use it as my initial slide. Um, this picture, as many others that I'm going to be showing, are new acquisitions to the archives, which I wanted to showcase um, so that some of you who might have seen me see, speak before will be seeing a few new things. And also, I'm going to be showing off some of my favorite items from the archives. Um, but just to continue my ship theme, most uh, Jewish immigrants arrived in conditions such as this one, much more crowded and, and maybe in a group, uh, sometimes sponsored by an agency. Uh, such as Jewish Immigrant Aid Services or the Jewish Colonization Association. The group that you see in this picture arrived in Halifax in 1924, and many, many of them came on to Montreal, which was the center of the Canadian universe at that time, and of course, in my opinion, still is. And, um, uh, and, uh, and, also, and also, they went to many other places in Canada. And as for those shoe boxes, well, who among us doesn't keep at least some of your archival papers, your personal papers in shoe boxes, whether it's photographs or cards that you receive? Well, I certainly do. And I was going to show a picture of my vast shoe box collection as an illustration, but I decided to go with something more archival and significant. So the shoe boxes that I show you here hold part of over 60 years worth of sermons, which we recently received from the son of Rabbi Wilfred Shushat, who was the rabbi of the Shara Shemayim Synagogue for 60 years. And he saved every one of his sermons on cue cards, mostly in shoe boxes, which we received in 2020. Um, once we received them, we transferred them to better shoe boxes, as you can see on the right. I'm gonna start off by uh, taking you on a little trip uh, through the history of the archives to tell you how did the archives and all of its boxes get to where it is today. So there'll be no more shoe boxes discussed in this lecture, although up in the right hand corner here, you do see a few of them. But we will begin with the history of Canadian Jewish Congress. My page down isn't working, excuse me. There we go. Um, because as Heather mentioned in the introduction, the archives, uh, which is now called the Alex Dworkin Canadian Jewish Archives, began with Canadian Jewish Congress. 
And the Congress was founded as the Parliament of Canadian Jewry in 1919 with a mission of advocating for Jewish rights and freedoms in Canada and also with regards to lobbying um, regarding immigration, uh, which was certainly an issue for uh, Jews in 1919. It was one of the peak years for immigration. Um, what you see here is the delegates to the first Canadian Jewish Congress. They're assembled on the steps of the Baron de Hirsch building, which was on Blurry Street in Montreal. And they actually met at the Monument National Theater, which was right down the street from there. And yet the Congress wasn't very active for its first 15 years after the initial enthusiasm um, of that first year, which included the founding of the Jewish Immigrant Aid Services, Dias, um, they were almost inactive until 1934 when rising anti-Semitism caused them to reconvene. And it was in the 1930s that some of the Jews uh, could, that were involved with Canadian Jewish Congress, such as Harry Hirschman and H.M. Kaiserman, um, began to talk about having an archives. Apparently, according to another, um, uh, another devotee of the archives, David Rome, who I'll discuss in a moment, according to David Rome, people were dropping off archival documents at, or historic documents at H.M. Kaiserman's office from 1919 onward as he was the sole representative of Canadian Jewish Congress for a while. But uh, in the um, early 30s, Harry Hirschman wrote this pamphlet in Yiddish, which was the lingua franca of most of the Jewish community of the time. And the pamphlet says, I've transliterated it here, Kennen wir in unsere Geschichte a project, pardon my pronunciation, those of you in the audience who do speak Yiddish. Um, what it means is Canadian Jews and their history, a project. And it was a proposal in the context of the rising anti-Semitism of the 1930s and the xenophobia of, that was starting to uh, show itself even in Canada. Hirschman and his committee advocated for preserving the Jewish community's documents in order to establish the legitimacy of the Jewish presence in Canada by pointing out its historical and economic and social accomplishments. So it was kind of a public relations tool as well as a preservation project. And um, the, their proposal became part of the resolutions of the second plenary assembly of Canadian Jewish Congress in 1934, which proposed that whereas there are in Canada numerous documents and other historical material of the utmost value to the history and cultural achievements of Jews in Canada, I won't read you the whole thing, but it, they conclude that it is necessary for this material to be collected and stored so that it may be made easily accessible to students or the Jewish historian for the purpose of study and reference. And it is of the general interest that this, that and well being of Canadian Jewry that this historical material be preserved. And so they entrusted a committee to do so. Um, uh, one of the, so one of the most important people on this committee was David Rome, who had a friend of H.M. Kaiserman's, who had come to Montreal in the late 30s to work for the Labour Zionists and later for Canadian Jewish Congress. And he joined the Archives Committee and was in charge of drawing up their first inventory, which was published in 1939. And what I find really interesting about this 15 page inventory with its hundreds of items is that many of them are so new in the 1930s that the ink was barely dry when they were deposited in the archives. So if you can read the script on the screen, you'll notice that item 205 in the middle here, don't know if my, do you see a arrow? I think you do, if I do this. Um, that the item 205 is a leaflet about a meeting of the Russian Polish Hebrew Sick Benefit Association in 1936. And then the next item is a letter from the Polish Consul General about the Polish situation in 1936. And the last item on my little list is an address by Rabbi Dubitsky of the Electoral College in 1936. So um, not what you consider historic documents in the context of the time when this, this list was drawn up. Um, part of the reason for this was that it was difficult for them to find founding documents of the Canadian Quebec Jewish community in their early amateur efforts to do so. But the other 
thing I think was that they did realize that what they were collecting would be of historic significance and was worth preserving for the future so that we could study them today. Well, eventually the headquarters of the Canadian Jewish Congress be, uh, was lodged in this building, which you may know if you know Montreal, it still stands at the corner of Dr. Penfield and Cote de Neige. And it opened in 1970, at the time when Saul Hayes was the executive director of Canadian Jewish Congress, uh, a, a post that he held from 1939 to 1974. And even in, in his retirement, Saul Hayes made the archives a very important uh, project and concern. And he, he worked very hard to get collections for the archives and, um, and backed David Roman his, in his efforts to make the archives a going concern. He, he hired David Rome in the position of archivist officially in 1973 after Rome left the Jewish Public Library uh, where he had served as director. And that's the picture that you see on that screen, on the screen is how I remember David Rome when I started at the archives as a contract worker in 1986 and then later as director. This is how he would greet people at his desk and sit them down and ask them about their research and um, how he taught me what I know about the archives and how I came to love the work of being an archivist. Well, the archives today, this is a, t a very text heavy slide, I will not read it, but I just want to give you a sense that the bits and pieces I'm going to show you are not representative of the whole mass of 6,000 bankers boxes that we have on site and, and a few in remote storage, which span from early, the, from a few pages from the 1700s all the way through to very recent papers and geographically go from Victoria BC to Corner Brook, Newfoundland. Um, these are papers which have been used by a variety of, uh, for a variety of uses from filmmaking to book writing, to family history seeking, uh, to scholarly research and community uses as well. Um, the Canadian Jewish Congress records themselves constitute about a quarter of these holdings and include a lot of very important information about human rights issues, immigration, demographics, and political and social issues. But there are other major collections such as the Jewish Immigrant Aid Services and the United Jewish Relief Agencies and the United Restitution Organization and women's organizations such as the National Council of Jewish Women and Jewish Women International Bnei B'rith. And we have the records of the Vad Hayir, Labor Zionist Alliance. We have synagogue records of some major congregations. And we also have collections of individuals of note, um, such as S.W. Jacobs and Judge Alan Gold and Sheila Finestone and um, the DeSola family. Um, and for what I'm gonna be showing you will illustrate a little bit of that, but it's also an idiosyncratic selection, which will include things that are not on this list. Once again, having a bit of trouble advancing my slide. Don't know why it does this. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, and just a little set, uh, a little explanation of our name changing. You see what's happening with that moving slide there? Um, in 2006, the Canadian Jewish Congress was formally dissolved. And at that point, we changed our name. Um, the Alex Dorkin Canadian uh, Foundation for Jewish Archives is the main source of financing for the Canadian Jewish Archives. So the Alex Dorkin name has been added to Canadian Jewish Archives to form our name, our present name. And we are also supported by the Azraeli Foundation and the Bibliothèque et Archives Nationales de Québec. And we're no longer located in the former Canadian Jewish Congress headquarters. In 2018, we moved to a very large building situated on the corner of Jean Talon West and Victoria Avenue at the corner of, of at the, at, near the edge of Tanamart Royal in, in Cote de Neige, near the edge of Tanamart Royal. 
and we don't occupy the whole building. It is, it is so large, it actually has two postal codes, one at each entrance. Um, however, where the little yellow arrow is on the side is where our windows look out. We're on the second floor. And this is a picture of our door where you can see all the way down to um, my assistant's desk. And here is our, um, our researcher area, which is large and open and, where it, and has windows, unlike our spot where the researchers worked in our former building. Um, and you can see researchers and a volunteer at work here. This was pre-pandemic. Um, we, we do have people on site still, and we're about to open up even further starting uh, next week. Um, but we've been separating people a bit more um, in having only one person at a time for a while. Um, and uh, there have been masks on our people, which, which you do not see in this picture. Um, also, because this space is, is so nice and large, we can put in a few extra tables and have a whole class visit us and teach them about using primary sources, which has been a great, uh, a great feature for our outreach. Um, we, we do a lot of work with people uh, who are researching their family history or locating personal records for attestations, such as when did they immigrate or where were they born. Um, we don't have uh, the formal life cycle, cycle records, but the Jewish Immigrant Aid Service collection and other collections such as that uh, do provide personal information about people which are useful for these purposes. Well. I'm going to give you a sampling from our holdings, more or less chronological, and drawing on some of my favorite items. So just to give you some context, the earliest Jews to settle in Quebec were the Hart family and the earliest documented Jewish settlers in Quebec. And they, um, Aaron Hart arrived in 1765 with the British Army, um, and they lived in Three Rivers. However, we have very, very little uh, in the archives that is original to the Hart family of that period. The oldest document that we have, the oldest original piece of paper in the archives is this issue of the London Chronicle of March, 1765, which, um, okay, it's a newspaper. It's not a unique archival document, but there aren't too many copies around anymore, I would think. And what is Jewish about it is that there's a list at the uh, bottom left of the page of the Montreal merchants at the time. And it mentions two Jewish names, Ezekiel Solomons and Gershon Levy. Um, you can see Gershon Levy about two thirds of the way down on the left-hand side and, uh, and Ezekiel Solomons a little bit above him. And you may have noticed, I looked down at my watch, but it wasn't because I was caring about the time, but because I only know left by looking at my hand. But that is it doesn't matter. All right. <laughs> this is another very early document of ours. And I think it, it says some interesting cultural uh, things. It is a, a circumcision certificate written by Dr. Joel Hart. And what he writes is, this is to certify that on the 8th day of July, 1816, and then he gives the Jewish equivalent of that date, I performed the covenant of circumcision on Abraham, the son of Henry and Rachel Joseph, born in Berthier in the province of Lower Canada on the 14th of November, 19, uh, 1815. Now, first, just a bit of background for listeners who um, who aren't Jewish and don't, uh, that circumcision is a, a covenant, a, a ritual performed on Jewish bo uh, baby boys, usually at uh, seven days of age, unless there's a health reason that delays it very, very slightly. But uh, here we see that this was done in November and the baby was born in July. The reason would, for this would be that there were very few Jews in Quebec at the time. There, was no ritual circumciser who made applied his trade in birthday Quebec and the family must have waited until someone they trusted to do the, this kind of delicate work uh, came to their area. So um, it does show how a the, um, the, the 
the, fam the, the family cared about carrying on the Jewish tradition and, and B, that they were, they were a very small community at the time. The Joseph family um, of which we were just speaking uh, it was one of the earliest and very important Jewish families in Quebec. And we do have a fair bit of, bit of information about them. Now, Abraham, that baby we just talked about is seen in the middle upper part of this slide. He was obviously much older in this picture. And the uh, father of the family, Henry Joseph is seen off on the left-hand side. And he had five or six, I think, I think it was five children, some of whom are shown here. Um, but um, the document that I want to show you related to this family is extremely hard to read, but I have spent much time puzzling through it because I find it very fascinating. It's a family newsletter, kind of along the, the lines of a blog or sort of a Facebook page in a way, because the family members in Montreal would write it up and then circulate it to family members who are living in Berthier and living in Quebec City. And in it, we see a blend. This, is, this was written when they were younger than in the picture you just saw. They were teenagers, but I don't have a picture of them there uh, at that time. They would, uh, they would put in this newsletter called The Blue Book, uh, little jokes and anecdotes, and every once in a while, a column called Religious Intelligence, which is what you see on the starting on the halfway down the left-hand side. Um, and in this particular one, they talk about how a ball was given on Friday night at Belmont Place, and that although most of the Israelites in our city were invited, none but one weak-minded mortal attended. And the reason that they call this weak-minded person this, per this, this person weak-minded was that it's Friday night and that's the Sabbath for Jews and going to a ball isn't the right thing to do. And so they go on to say, what cares she for the awful commandment, Zahor et Yom HaShabbat L'Kad Show, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And this is written in very bold Hebrew text as well as translated into English. So we see here that both the Joseph, Joseph family was involved in the general life of the city, and also that they were very conscious of being Jewish and wanted to stand back from it and be distinctive in keeping their religion on the other hand. And this plays out over and over again in the kind of comments that are made jokingly and yet seriously in, the, in this newsletter, of which we have 15 issues in all. It goes from 1839 to 1841, I believe, or 43, 43. Anyway, in the 40s. Um, another early, uh, not quite as early, but early uh, document, pre-1900 document that I'm very fond of is the various volumes we have of the diary of Clarence de Sola. And Clarence's mother was one of those Joseph women that you saw two slides back in the, um, in the top right, but never mind unless you're reviewing this on YouTube and can go back. Um, anyway, his father was Abraham de Sola, the rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, who also lectured at McGill teaching Hebrew and was well known even in the United States and was also a publisher of prayer books and Hebrew books. Um, Clarence was the younger, a, a younger son and he started a diary in 1873, or at least that's the first one we have when he was 14. Um, he was writing that first one on scrap paper of his father's office. So you can see this page here is partly scrap paper and partly his own handwriting. And um, in it, we, we learn a little bit about what his father, the rabbi was up to because um, well, he starts off just saying he read some of Tom Brown at Oxford and practiced and did some of my fort because in January 1873, of course, there was a lot of snow and he was building a snow fort, which he mentions in several entries. And then he says, Mr. Goldberg reads the service while Papa is away. He therefore read it tonight. And then the next day, he says, Meldola read the Parsha and Haftorah today as Papa is away, and Mr. Goldberg, the Shamas, does not read them well. Meldola reads very well. Meldola 
is his bro older brother, who you can see at the bottom uh, right hand side, and uh, who became a rabbi in Cantor himself later on. Now, Clarence um, kept on keeping diaries into his adulthood. And I, I just I, I chose to give you another slide about him because I know that many of the Quebec Anglo Heritage Network members uh, have connections to the Eastern Townships and might be amused by this particular entry. Um, he's a young man at the time and he writes in on the 1st of June, 1881, I've recently been making a couple of business trips on Thursday, the 3rd of May, I left here for Granby, arriving there at noon that day. From Granby, I went to Waterloo the same evening. And after remaining in Waterloo during the morning, on the 4th, I proceeded via the road along Brome Lake to Knowlton. After doing some business in Knowlton, I took a horse and wagon and drove through Sweetsbury to Cowansville. I left Cowansville late that evening for that celebrated fashionable resort, Newport, and after sleeping at Newport, left early in the morning of the 5th to go to Stansted. From Stansted, I drove to Smith's Mills and from the latter took the train for Sherbrooke. Now, I don't know about you, but my head is reeling from the thought of all that traveling in present day time with, with motorized vehicles. And he was doing all this in a horse and carriage. So I'm quite impressed. Um, and I just uh, thought if, for those of you who know the Eastern Townships well, you can, you can picture this whole Tra trajectory, I'm sure. Well, I'm now going to turn to some documents from the immigrants who arrived later than the Joseph family, those who came from the late 1800s and early 1900s on, which is really when the waves of Jewish immigration um, came to Quebec up until the point where the doors kind of closed just prior to the Second World War and on until the ending of the Second World War. The Jews who arrived during this period of time mostly left because things were not going well in the places where they were living. Um, the passport that you see on the left-hand side of the screen is from Latvia and so, uh, belonging to Sophia Rosengarten who went to live in Quebec City and her and the passport under nationality says the word Hebrew or Jewish in Latvian. So you can see it was it it was part of the identity of as people were perceived in their in their country of origin. And, and some of these passports are actually exit only passports. You can't go back with them. Um, also, because we're all thinking of Ukraine these past days, I included a Ukrainian travel document. This one is for a family who went through the United States to get to Canada. And on one of their other travel documents, it was interesting to note that they are, the, the document lists their social class. They're listed as middle class, um, which is something you don't see on documents these days, I believe, or perhaps you still do in, in Russia but, or in Ukraine, but not here. Um, some other documents of interest from the early 1900s are this, I'm, I'm very fond of this, aff, this affidavit for Solomon Abel in Montreal in 1918, where he declares, I, Solomon Abel Taylor, residing at St. and he gives his address on St. Dominic Street in Montreal, and he solemnly declares he is 40 years of age, that I am no idler and I am occupied in a useful occupation in the city of Montreal that I'm married to Dave, Dave, Dame Sophie Zuskin since the year 1900, and that said marriage took place in Russia in accordance with the rules of the Hebrew religion. And then he goes on um, about when he came to Canada in 1907 and how he supports his wife and his six children. And you can see his photograph, you really get a sense of, of the details of his life in this little document. And also on the other side of the page, I show you a, um, advertisement for a, a certificate made out by Rabbi Colton, who was, as he says in his little uh, description below his picture, a practical moil, as in ritual circumciser, and marriage performer. Uh, we have the books in which he recorded these marriages and circumcisions, which are very useful for family history research. Um, Jewish schools were a way that the um, 
the Quebec Jews kept their culture and identity. Um, both schools that were day schools in view of attending the Pro Protestant school, um, and also afternoon schools where those who went to Protestant school would go to get a Jewish education after hours. And um, there you can see that the name of the school is written in Yiddish, um, this being a language that did endure despite the migration of the Jewish community towards the English language, which is why we come to be part of the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network at this time, I guess. Um, the collection at the, at the Canadian Jewish Archives also includes a lot of things that are against Jews because the Canadian Jewish Congress was very concerned with anti-Semitism and both, both to document it and to and protest against it and to counteract it in any way they could. So these we have notices, we have newspaper articles with, containing these horrible caricatures. We also have notices ripped off the walls of places such as St. Agath. And um, I know we've got someone from St. Agath listening to this lecture tonight who probably knows all about these notices. Um, hello, Joseph Graham and company. Um, and uh, as you can see, this uh, notice says well, in both English and French that Jews are not wanted in St. Agath and scram all the going is good. Um, since it was a popular vacation location and also the location of the Mount Sinai Sanatorium, um, the Jewish presence was both very important and, and probably very threatened by this kind of, of advertisement in the late 1930s. Um, when the war began, the German Jews who were interned or who had immigrated to England to escape from Germany and from Austria were interned in England and then sent to Canada. And thus, thus we have records about both their internment here and also efforts to get them out of the camps, um, the things that the Jewish community of Montreal of, of Canada did to help them. Um, we have some interesting documents about this period, such as a book of watercolor sketches donated by um, the son of Julius Pfeiffer, who was interned at Ilonua, which was where the most religious of the Jewish interns ended up, in, internees ended up. And the sketchbook is an interesting contrast between the world behind bomb, barbed wire and the Jewish presence there. The, there you can see prayers taking place in the internment camp in the second picture. Um, the internees also set up schools so that the younger internees could continue their in education. They were a very educated and also artistic bunch of people in, in many uh, instances. Another wartime uh, document that, or a series of documents that I'm fond of is this series of comic books put out by Canadian Jewish Congress called Jewish War Heroes. Um, they were intended for young people, but they were also a public relations device because they were a way of showing the wider community that Jews did fight in the war, that there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of Jewish participation in the military and, and a lot of Jewish war heroes. And, and um, this particular page documents a Montrealer who actually was killed in action. And so we arrive at the post-war period. And um, this makes me think about the docu documents in our enormous Jewish Immigrant Aid Services collection, which is accessed so often for family history purposes now, but also has been used by scholars to document both the way people got to Canada and how they settled in once here. The joyous newsletter that you see on this page provides a description of what they, how they perceived the refugees saw life in, new, in, the, in their new country, how they dealt, how they were dealing with it. They, they write in the newsletter that um, uh, sloping down from Mount Royal in the heart of Canada's metropolis, uh, that's Montreal, is Fletcher's Field. And they describe Fletcher's Field on the side of Mount Royal and talk about how it, it, this area was, has been known as a playground for Montreal's old and young. But during the past year, Fletcher's Field has changed. This is written in 1947. Um, not 
in contour nor in space, but to such an extent that it, it's in attendance, it has been renamed Refugee Boulevard for the large number of newcomers who on Sunday mornings fill it in such large numbers that it looks like an open air meeting. And um, this is this is a, a newsletter where they they also talk about other about the ways people are adapting and they they run lost people uh, notices where people are looking for relatives they lost in the war trying to track them down. Um, the Jaius also had a citizenship school. So you can see in this picture, Joe Cage, who is the director of Jaius, uh, conferring a diploma on a student. And on the background, in the, on the blackboard, you can see, I am a new Canadian with Canadian spelt in French. So I don't know what they were, whether they were teaching them very accurately about spelling, but anyway, that's life in Canada. We always mix up our English and French spellings. We also have, although it's not our specialty, we have a lot of records about survivors. Now, collecting material on survivors and what they brought with them is really the mandate of the Montreal Holocaust Museum, but nonetheless, things have come to us in the course of collecting other things about people. And Adam Gutman, who created these two works, um, when, was also a musician known under the name of George Adams and wrote a lot of uh, music for the uh, Quebec hit, hit parade in French in the 1960s. But he was a survivor and he lost his brother and sister in the Second World War. He painted this picture of train tracks, which he calls tracks to somewhere um, and which now hangs in the archives reading room. And he painted it in 1963 under the name B Benjamin Rejek, which is the name of his brother and sister. And he wrote this poem among many poems he wrote, which includes the words, I, I danced my way through life. The dance is called a survivor's strife. The melodies were pulsating with sadness, a lot of terrible surprises and sheer madness. And it's interesting that how he ends it where he says, liberated, I found my way out and it's hard for me to talk more about. It seems to be, kind of the typical sort of wistful way in which some of the survivors would perceive their experiences or be able to express their experiences. Since the 1950s, many other cultural groups have, arri um, have arrived in Quebec, Jew Jewish, groups, who, Jewish um, groups from many countries. Um, one, a significant community who arrived, which arrived in the 1950s was the Iraqi Jewish community. Um, and we've recently received a collection of videotaped interviews from Dr. Norma Joseph, who has documented the, the food of the community and how, it's, how it serves a community purpose. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the word ashtidek, which I have uh, taken from the title of, uh, of a, a video she put together about this it, uh, is a, an Iraqi expression, which means um, long life to your hands and is used when a meal is served and the food is particularly good. And other languages which um, are expressed by other recent uh, cultural groups are of course French, uh, the Moroccan and North African Jews who came from the 1950s onwards um, were mainly francophone um, in, in, in their primary language. Um, we have both interviews with the, uh, uh, the, these Moroccan and, and Jews from other Arab countries. And we have a, a, a series of film outtakes by Jacques Ben-Simon, which um, documents the years between 1956 and 76 among the Moroccan Jewish community of Montreal. And on the other screen, I represent the Russian Jewish community, which we began collecting uh, in the early 2000s. They had been arriving since 1990. And we made a project of collecting the material um, of recently arrived Jewish, uh, Jewish Russian immigrants. Most of the material is in Russian. I got to figure out the alphabet, but I can't say I can read most of it but it, is, it will be of interest to researchers. 
um, speaking of Soviet or Jews from the so former Soviet Union, the Canadian Jewish Congress collection illustrates advocacy on behalf of oppressed Jewry in other countries, including, of course, the Soviet Union, but also Syria and other countries. And um, you can see in this picture Erwin Kotler in the early 70s and the members of the group of 35, which is a women's group that included Goldie Hirshon and uh, Wendy Eisen and um, Barbara Stern and uh, Andrea Bronfman and many other well-known names in our community. Um, women's groups also uh, were took up took up many activist causes, and this um, illustration is of an, also related to Soviet Jewry on the left-hand side. It, it's one of the posters in an album of the B'nai B'rith women, Jewish Jewish Women International, also known as B'nai B'rith Women of Canada, Jewish Women of Canada International. Anyway. Um, it, they they um, made albums to rep, to keep all their archival materials, and one of our favorite albums from this collection actually includes a a bagel, a, a half a bagel, which was stuck into the album in 1972 and is about to celebrate its 50th anniversary, and um, it's still in pretty good shape for a 50 year old bread product, though we wouldn't advise anyone eat it. Um, it was stuck in the album to depict their their lox and bagel uh, event in June of 72. And I'm very happy to report that they did not include the smoked salmon along with the bagel. And so our collecting continues and um, added in uh, 2021 to our Spanier family collection, which we began um, collecting many years ago, donated by Beverly Spanier. Um, we now have documentation of the subject of COVID-19 in as represented by Beverly Spanier's um, publication where she explains her ongoing fight for patient rights during the pandemic. And you may have seen Beverly on the news quite often as a spokesperson for Maimonides Geriatric um, Hospital and speaking of the problems facing the patients there. So we're happy to be able to continue this collection and to provide such timely information, which will be of significance for years to come. Well, I'm going to end off just with a few words to you about how you can do um, research on, um, on your own about the subjects in our collections. So I would suggest that you start off by going to the website, the Canadian Jewish Heritage Network, cjhn.ca, and it occurs to me, as I say the name in the context of speaking to the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network, that perhaps when we developed this website in 2010, it was in the back of my mind <laughs> that the QAHN existed and they had such a great name that we were going to poach from it. Because although I, don't, I didn't consciously choose the name um, with QAHN in mind, it certainly does evoke it, doesn't it? Now, um, because of, uh, as, a, as a nod to our, our Eastern Township um, uh, connections of the QAHN, I thought I'd show you a typical search by running the words Sherbrooke, Quebec in our search box. So when you go to the website, uh, you'll, you'll see an opening page which lists all the organizations that are included in it. It's not just the Alex Dworkin Canadian Jewish Archives, but also our co-founders of the site, the Jewish Public Library Archives, and then the partners that joined subsequently, the Montreal Holocaust Museum, the Ottawa Jewish Archives, the St. John Jewish Historical Museum, the Shar Shemaya Museum and Archives, and the Spanish and Portuguese Synagogue. So when you search on the site, you will find materials from all of these places. And once you plug in your search term, you'll get results. Now, Sir Quebec, apparently gave us 222 results on 12 pages. And if that would be too much for you to deal with, you could begin to narrow down your search. So as you see, there's a, a, gray, a, box, a series of gray boxes on the side where you can choose to 
only look for a certain type of material, such as photographs or documents. You can only look for digital materials, meaning only things where the picture's online. You can narrow down which repository you're looking at, looking for. So you could choose to only look for material from the Canadian Jewish Archives if you wanted to. And um, you could also choose whether you want to look at file level or just to look, look at a general correct collection description. Um, you can uh, click on the more details to see the full record. And if there's a second picture, it will turn up that way, or if there's a PDF document attached. And you can use permalink to bookmark what you found so that if you wanted to write to, to me and say, well, how would I take a look at this thing? I, it's much easier for me if you give me a link to where you, what you saw online so that I can go on to help you. Um, you'll see that the, the, one, the, the results that turned up in this first search gave us the War Efforts Committee of Sherbrooke, something about congregation Agudath Achim, um, something about a, modeled a model Seder uh, sponsored by Canadian Jewish Congress, and something about someone who lives in Sherbrooke or, or lived in Sherbrooke, Myron Eckenberg. Um, and finally, just one last little treasure of the archives that I want to leave you with before. I stop. Um, I wanted to, sh to show you something that we discovered in a guest book, which was donated to us um, after it had lived for many years in the home of Norman Friedman of Westmount, who used to ask all his guests to sign his book. And it is full of important signatures. And one of them is um, the name Leonard Norman Cohen of Belmont Avenue, which is, yes, the Leonard Cohen, the singer. And in 1958, he writes, this is the third time my name is entered in your book. Two decades ago, my late father wrote it for me. And because of that, the letters are dear to me. When I was bar mitzvah, as in 13 years old, I wrote my own name and dimly remember that occasion. Now I write it again, this time with a clearer knowledge of what remarkable people my host and hostesses are. Isn't, wasn't he charming? Gracious. Let us hope that he didn't write that. I'm saying it. Let us hope that the fourth time I sign my name, I will finally have accomplished something which will merit my inclusion among your distinguished and beloved visitors. Well, I think Leonard they made good, didn't don't don't you? But I'm you know I'm a fan. Um, anyway, I hope that you all can come in to sign the archives guest book soon and become among our distinguished visitors. Thank you. That is all I wanted to say. And Janice, gonna... that was wonderful. Thank you very much. It, it's a, a delightful uh, presentation that you've given us. And just before we, we open it up for questions, I'm just going to ask Glenn just to remind everybody how they can ask questions. And, and I know we have some in the chat box already. So I'll just put myself on mute for a moment and then Glenn can just uh, help a few people to uh, get the questions going. Thanks, Heather. Yes, great to see all the discussion in the chat box. Um, so if you have a question to ask, um, the chat box is, is where to go. Um, you can simply write, I would like to ask a question, in which case we can unmute your microphone and you can turn on your camera if you want to ask Janice directly. Uh, if you're a bit camera shy, um, you can just uh, type your question in the chat box on Zoom and uh, Heather or myself will deliver it on your behalf. If you're watching on Facebook, um, I will do my best to check in there if you have any questions and I'll relay them um, to Janice for you. Um, so yes, a reminder again, the chat box is at the bottom of your screen if you're on a laptop or PC and if you're on a mobile device, you may have to tap your screen once to make the chat box appear. Um, and I'll leave it there. Heather, I, I bet you have a question. Of course. <laughs> Janice, I'll, I'll kick it off and then we'll go to our, our chat box uh, people. And you can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to, and uh, we'll, we'll bring you in that way. Um, you had Yiddish documents. And I, I wondered if, uh, do you translate the documents for people that are, are uh, doing research or do you have volunteers who, who can read it for people that don't know Yiddish? Um, <clears throat> yes, we do uh, help people out with that. Um, one of our best um, volunteer and or and or hireable translators is 
um, actually listening to this talk, Aaron Krishtalka, who is a, a absolute marvel at Yiddish. He was raised in a Yiddish speaking home and I always recommend him because he also has the historical knowledge that is needed to really give a nuanced interpretation of the documents that are involved because he's a history professor himself. So a retired history professor. So um, we do have a marvelous resource in him and, and, and others who um, uh, have, have been volunteers for us or who I've come to know in the course of the time of the archive. So we can find a way to get you greater knowledge about the Yiddish resources, yes. Okay, thank you. Now, Marion has a question. What did refugees do if they did not have an occupation or job waiting for them? I'm assuming that JIAS played an important role, but immigrants have always been validated based on the occupational value they represented, not to be a burden on the host country. Well, that's true that um, it was always easier to get in if a job was already waiting. And one of the things that Jaius helped facilitate was to get people who were already on site to attest that a job was waiting for someone. And sometimes it would be a relative. Jaius would probably put pressure on the relatives to guarantee the sustenance for the people arriving. If there was no relative, there were organizations, the Canadian Jewish Congress reached out to um, to get people jobs. The, after the war, delegations went from labor movements to the camps and chose people to be tailors or to be millinery workers. And sometimes these tailors, and there was a recent film about the tailors project um, done out of Toronto that's excellent. Um, Paula Draper and others worked on it. Um, now this, some of these tailors had very little experience with being tailors and maybe didn't stay in the tailoring business very long once they got here, but it got them, it got them here and it got them that, that initial job, which allowed them to settle. Okay, great. Uh, we have, See, uh, oh, sorry, some, go ahead. We have an on, an on air question. Uh, Rachel, Rachel, I'm just going to unmute you. I hope that's okay. Rachel, you're on the air. Thank you. Hi, Janice. Terrific talk. Okay, two questions. One, when you were giving a list of, um, when they listed a group of Jews and you mentioned that there were two of them, Solomon's Levy or Gershon Levy mm -hmm. and whatever, I noticed another name there that looked like Philip Jacobs. That one could have been Jewish mm -hmm. because Jacobs could be a Jewish name, but we're not aware of the history of Philip Jacobs. So we didn't, I didn't mention him because we have no documentation that he was Jewish and it might not have been a Jewish name. Um, but it's okay. possible. Yeah. It, it, Philip, it wasn't such a Jewish name at the time. This is 1700s, so yeah. it could have been a Protestant name. Possibly. The second one, when you had the photograph of all the delegates in front of Baron de Hirsch in 1919, the Congress of Delegates in 1919, I noticed at the very, in the front line, the fourth man from the right, um, he looked like he was black. Um, he was very dark skinned. And that would be very interesting to know who that man was. If he was, he was just the shadow, but it didn't seem to be a shadowy day. So it'd be very interesting to know who he might be. I uh, don't have the photograph as one of my papers that I was potentially gonna read off of because there was nothing to read on that slide. So I can't look at that particular name, but I don't recall actually that there were any black delegates at the first plenary. There were some women that we hardly noticed, by the way, but they're they're not in the front row and they have hats on too, but there are quite a lot of women. Um, but I think that that particular individual you're talking about was just kind of in shadow. And so, Be curious to find out not the that name. I know I do have Maybe all the names. Them. Yeah, I do yeah. have all the names. So um, we could we could okay. research this further. Great, I have thank you. I see a few hands raised here. Marilyn uh, has her hand raised. Marilyn, I'm just going to unmute you. Marilyn, you're okay, on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Janice. That was really terrific. I am the late Saul Hayes' daughter, and I really, really remember his passion about the archives. What a lot of people don't know about him is he was also an historian. So he really, really wanted to make sure 
that many things were kept and stored and were be good for research. As a matter of fact, I'm a genealogist and I have used the archives in searching actually his family as well as the other members of the family. So I just wanted to say that. I, I want to add a comment that attests to Saul Hayes's knowledge, breadth of knowledge of Jewish matters, um, his, uh, historical Jewish matters. We have a Bible at the archives, which was published in 1581. It was one of the first printed Bibles and it's very important, but there's something in that Bible that lets us know that it is an authentic early one and not a later version. And that is that there was a misprint of a pronoun in a particular passage. And when we were told about this misprint by the um, archivist uh, and librarian at the Lowy Collection in Ottawa, um, uh, the, um, uh, he, he said, he told me about the passage. I went looking for it and I found it was bookmarked with a piece of paper from Saul Hayes's desk because Saul Hayes knew about this and he had, it wasn't an acid free piece of paper. So it really shouldn't be in that Bible but I left it there as an attestation that Saul Hayes realized that this was a significant issue and uh, was bringing it to our attention. And guess who's a proofreader? <laughs> <laughs> That apple doesn't fall far, yes. No. Very good. I see I've raised hand from um, Marion. Marion, I'm just going to unmute you. Marion. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Janice. I, I learned so much from this, and it was really so eye-opening and, and so personal, the story, too, because uh, we, when we were cleaning in my parents' basement, we came across these immigration papers that were so precious to come across um, with my maternal grandparents who came and she came with five kids and I think it just said you know how much money do you have in your possession and it said five dollars and it said occupation and it said housewife farmer and I don't know if this is, was such a skill that was considered or perceived in demand but she was they were refugees they were escaping from the pogroms in, in Russia and I think uh, it was just so insightful how you were explaining about different things because even now you know, immigrants are really validated based on what skill sets that are unique that they could bring. So there are so many people who are desperate, just desperate to get out. So I just really thank you so much for, for your, your presentation, which really just reiterated and contextualized my family's history in, in Canada. Well, thank you so much for saying that. And actually what you said about farmers is so key. I should have mentioned it earlier when I was talking about work waiting people is, for a long period of time, the only way you, one could convince the Canadian authorities to let a refugee in was to say they would be valuable as a farmer. And so the fact that she de declared she was a housewife and farmer, it was, you know, like, and I'm a farmer, let me in, you know, I'm really useful to you. Um, so th that's really significant that it was written um, at that time in that way. Um, the, um, uh, the, 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 in fact, at, at that period of time, or for a long period of time, the Canadian Immigration Department wasn't just the Canadian Department of Immigration, it was called the Department of Mines and Resources, and they sort of had the sideline in immigration because they weren't really interested in anyone who didn't have the potential to fulfill, fulfill the most pressing work needs in Canada. Janice, I see there's a question from Lawrence Kaplan. Uh, he asks, what's the function of Abel's affidavit? Uh, I was afraid you might pick up on that. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure why that particular affidavit was written. I have a feeling he was going to travel to the United States and the United States required that, that they weren't letting someone in who was gonna you know, hang around and try to get work and not leave. Um, because we've seen affidavits of that type for people who want to cross borders, but it isn't explicitly stated in this particular document that that was why it was drawn up. Okay. Um, does the archives uh, collect oral history as well, the present day interviewing and that sort of thing? Well, we absolutely do have them from the past and we were very actively collecting them in the late 80s, early 90s when Aaron Harris was are a volunteer, an active volunteer with us and was doing some wonderful interviews, which we have in our collections. Um, 
And also we've got a major collection from Leslie Lutsky from his radio show, Canadian Jewish, uh, Montreal Jewish Digest, which includes literally thousands of interviews, including oral histories among other subjects. And we're always interested in them. Um, it's something that the Jewish Museum of Montreal has been doing a lot lately. So they've really picked up the, the, um, the relay on the oral, on the, on the contemporary oral histories, but we have not lost interest at all. And we are digitizing many of the ones that we have on cassette tapes from the past. Okay, that's good. Um, I, and I was interested, oh, go ahead, Glenn, go ahead, ask. Well, um, here's, here's my question is, I realize there's, um, there's it was quite a lot of Jewish community institutions formed in the mid 20th century, like the Jewish Public Library, um, of course, later you mentioned the Holocaust Museum. I'm wondering um, about, I guess it's an ecosystem type question. How does the Dwork and Ar Archives fit into that? Um, do, you, uh, do you cooperate a lot with these institutions? Uh, even in terms of accessioning materials, do you sometimes say, you know, this would be better um, at, you know, the Jewish Public Library, which I believe also has an archives or the Holocaust Museum or Museum of Jewish Montreal? We absolutely do coordinate. It's central to the way we operate when we're offered a collection. We, um, we, we, through the Canadian Jewish Heritage Network website, we're much more aware of what each other collects, plus we've gotten to meet much more often. And we have a loose uh, conglomerate of archives, Jewish archives right across Canada, in fact, where even though the the archives where I work collects nationally, I will not accept anything offered from another region of Canada without first checking with the local archivist to see if they had been consulted. If it's redundant to them, it would tell people in Montreal more about other parts of Canada. So I'd be interested in, in having it, even if it does maybe overlap with what they have already out there. And with regard to within Montreal, we have our specialties. For example, I mentioned that the Holocaust Museum would get first refusal on material relating to survivors. The Jewish Public Library specialties include the arts and schools, and we specialize much more in, in immigration, human rights. And so we have our areas where we know to refer each other. Um, but, you know, in some, our collections grew up during the same eras and in some instances it's like an omelet where you can't unscrabble the eggs and there are overlaps between our collections and we celebrate that because there have been times when during the pandemic one one institution was more accessible than the other or due due to staffing issues here or there it's been good to have more than one place where students can get something in order to get their paper together at the last minute thank you heather Sorry to interrupt you before. No, I was, I was just, uh, I was quite interested in, in the uh, internment camps that the Jewish people faced in Quebec. Uh, and I, I actually have to say, I didn't know that. So that's, that's really interesting history. And do you have a large collection on that? It's, I, I would be interested to explore that further. Um, yes, our holdings are very extensive because the, the Canadian Jewish Congress and the United Relief Jewish Relief Agencies, which was connected to it, um, kept tabs on or kept a file about every Jewish interned person they knew about. So we have over a thousand case files, plus cards on even the non-Jews that they would that they had sort of surveyed in order to find all the Jews. So there are cards even on the non-Jewish internees. And we have personal collections from many of the internees, such as newsletters and paintings and memoirs and correspondence between with Canadian Jewish Congress people who visited the camp, such as Saul Hayes, and made reports about what was going on. So it, it is really extensive and it's 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 quite a story. Yes, it's um, yeah. and those people often went on to stay in Canada and become very prominent and respected as successful people in the community. So um, it's also an important part of our immigration history. Yeah, and it's just not taught, you know, it's just the, these holes in our history. And there's another one that's just, they're just not taught in high schools or, uh, you know, we should know this, these stories. So that's, thank you for bringing that to, to my attention and probably to other people who are watching today. It's, uh, it's really fascinating. I see that Lawrence has a question uh, related to that. So uh, with his hand raised. 
Lawrence, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, Thank you. Okay, you're online, Lawrence. Yeah, just to pick up on what Janice said about prominent people who are internees, since I'm, I'm, my expertise is Jewish philosophy, that uh, Emil Fackenheim, who is probably the most prominent Canadian Jewish philosopher ever, uh, was, one of, uh, was one of the internees, and then he went on to a, dis a distinguished career in the University of uh, Toronto. So that's just one example of of many of very prominent uh, uh, internees who went on, as I say, to contribute to Canadian life in general and Canadian Jewish life in particular. Thank you for that, Lawrence. I'm just gonna meet you. Um, I, I mean, I, I had a question too. I, I was also just boggled by that. I suspected they were interned because they were German, but there's a particular cruelty uh, to that situation of finding themselves in in an internment camp in Canada. Um, I realized they would be of the same generation as Holocaust survivors. Are there oral histories? Um, have that been collected from those uh, like internment camp stories, basically? What was life like in those camps? There was that lovely picture you presented, but I just wanna know more about what, what, what it was like for them. Um, there's a couple of really good books about it. And um, I think they give a lot of the feeling for what, what was going on. One of them is by Eric Koch and it's called Deemed Suspect. It's a little paperback book and um, it's extremely detailed. It even has a list in the back of what became of a lot of these people. And um, there are shorter things such as an article written by Julius Pfeiffer. Um, he, I think he titles it something like how I emigrated with $1.99 or something like that because he was you know, forced to come. Um, originally when they were, they were rounded up in England because they were born in, in Germany, um, they were interned along with, the, along with Nazi sympathizers and with conscientious objectors who were not Nazi sympathizers and they were all shipped over to Canada together under conditions where they were f surrounded by many people who, who were from Germany and were anti-Semitic. And it was only after being in the camp for a while that things got sorted out and there were camps established that were more specifically for German army officers and prisoners and, and well, the prisoners were kept separate, but the internees who were civilians, um, they were all mixed together at first and it was only sorted out later on. So it was not a good, so these camps were not only in Quebec, but also in New Brunswick, and in, there was one in Ontario. Um, it was quite a network. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting stories there. And um, love, to, love to have you come and, and see some of the material we have. I would love, I would love that, yeah. Yeah, Heather. me too. <laughs> well, it, it's, I, I'm not sure if there are any other questions from Facebook, uh, Glenn, uh, but I, I just can say that a lot of people are, are have enjoyed this presentation a lot. Uh, great presentation. Uh, this is from um, Mrs. Uh, Daphna, I think is how you say the name. Sorry if I've got that wrong. Great presentation as always. I worked with Janice years ago and she knows every scrap of paper, every photo, every item in those archives. So uh, <laughs> Thank you, I Daphne. believe it. Daphne yeah. is a trivia specialist. So hearing it from her is a compliment indeed. Very I, good. I do see a, a, a latter day question on uh, Facebook there. I'm gonna hop over and read it. Um, uh, it's from Sylvia in, in NDG. Um, she, she says, I have a question. There were two private clubs in Montreal, the DeSola Club, and the Montfiore Club. Were there any similar clubs for the Ashkenazi community? Hmm. You know, uh, there's an expert on the Montefiore Club in our audience, Rachel Alkali, who might be able to say whether that was really a Sephardic club, because I, I was under the impression that it was not limited to Sephardim. Um, and uh, the clubs of Montreal are also more the expertise of the Jewish Public Library and its archivists. So I have to pass on that question. <laughs> That's okay. We, we, all, we all do that sometimes. <laughs> um, I wondered when you say Sephardic there, I, I noticed the first wave of, of Jews starting with the Hart family were British Jews, but my understanding is those would have followed the Sephardic right. And um, is that what you mean? You're not talking about Iraqi Jews who arrived in the fifties, that would be, uh, Spanish Portuguese Jews that came through England. Uh, first of all, the Iraqi Jews were were um, ba Baghdadi were not technically Sephardic, although they got lumped in with the Sephardim later on. Um, 
But um, yes, the early Jews, as you mentioned, were identified with the Sephardic rite, but that was really more by virtue of the fact that the Sephardic rite was the kind of best right to be in England at the time. And so uh, it, it attracted people who were not of Spanish and North African origin. And then later on the wave that came in the fifties really was Sephardic in the sense of coming from North Africa. Um, uh, well, there's a lot of variety in the community is, uh, is what I could sum up just by saying. And, and I think in recent years, there's been a lot more mixing, mixing together of people from the different traditions so that um, the lines are not hard and fast in the community today. Do we have descendants of the Hart family still in Quebec? I feel like I should know that in our former president, Simon Jacobs, who's in Quebec City and is part of the Jewish community there. He, I'm sure he knows, but I'm curious because uh, that's such a fascinating lineage right there. I'm under the impression that in um, Quebec City and Three Rivers, the Hart family had pretty well assimilated in recent times. But there are a few Hart's descendants in Montreal. They're, the Hart Trophy was... Um, was sponsored by Cecil Hart not that long ago. I mean, not that long ago in historical sense, in a historical sense, and he was Jewish still. And um, in in Montreal, there um, there are there are some descendants that have married into other families, such as the Joseph family. So it's some of those early families are quite interconnected. Um, but right. it's not a, it's not it. a big going concern. Oh, and also I was told that Corey Hart was connected to that historic family, but I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> and there's also the uh, the discount store chain, which uh, I know is especially prominent in Eastern Quebec called Hart. And I always right. wondered if there was a connection there. I think it is connected, but not to the Jewish hearts. Okay. That's, that's what I have heard, but not, um, not totally. <laughs> I, I see a, a precision from Rachel here. Um, she mentions that while the Montfiore Club had a Sephardic name, the club, and she was a member, was definitely more Ashkenazi. Ah, okay, thank was, you for that, I was Rachel. right about that. Although on many of these historic questions, I have to say I'm not a historian. I just play one on TV. I provide the materials, but I don't really know history that much. I just, I just know what I like in the documents. <laughs> oh, no, it's wonderful. You, uh, I, I, I must say, you know, in these, these very difficult times that we're, we're living in right now, you realize how important archives are in society and the work that archivists do, how crucial it is that uh, people like you, Janice, are recording memory, community memory and individual stories. And whether it's through oral history or video files or, or images, that these stories are being preserved and protected in institutions like yours, a community institution that's supported by by a large community, uh, well, uh, maybe not large, but enthusiastic. <laughs> and uh, you know, how wonderful, uh, you've really shown how much you love this archives and its collection. I mean, uh, and you've really entertained us tonight, a bagel in the collection. I mean, that's wonderful. <laughs> and you knew it was there and that's really great. So uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up tonight. I know there's been a lot of wonderful uh, uh, comments on the side uh, and uh, I think we, we don't have any more questions coming in now, but I just want to thank you for such a delightful presentation and uh, filling us in on what the Alex Dorkin Jewish Archives contains. And it's it's so precious and, uh, and it's really quite wonderful. So it's been an honor to listen to you tonight. And uh, thank you to all of you who have joined us as well. It's, uh, it's been great to have you and uh, asking your questions. Uh, thanks to Glenn for always keeping us on track when it comes to the technology. And um, before we go, if you're interested, we're, we have another one of these sessions uh, next Tuesday with Daniel Dancero of the Pinnacle Mountain Land Trust. That's Tuesday, March 8th at 7 o'clock. Uh, her talk is called Small, Small Mountain, Big Symbol, 30 Years of Citizen Efforts to Preserve the Natural Heritage of the Pinnacle Mountain in Frelisburg in Quebec's Eastern Townships. So that sounds like another fun talk on Heritage Talks Online. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us this evening. And uh, thank you, Janice. It's been wonderful. And have a good evening, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.